Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan and today we continue our series that covers lesser known starships from various Star Wars factions. So far we've covered large ships in the Galactic Republic and Galactic Empire, and we've also looked at large ships and starfighters of the Rebel Alliance. Today we'll continue that series by taking a look at the lesser known starfighters of the Galactic Empire. But before we continue guys, make sure you're subscribed and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of this series. We've also heard that like, you know, dolphins have been messing with their fans and unsubscribing uh, them from our channel. Typical, typical. When I say A-Series Interceptor from Quant Systems Engineering, you're probably immediately going to think about the RZ-1 A-Wing. Or if you've watched our recent episode about the longest serving ships in the galaxy, you might be thinking about the R-Class Tactical Strike Fighter. This is an even safer bet because it was used by the Republic Navy for 4,000 straight years. But there's actually another line of A-Series, and at one point in time, they were going to be the mainline starfighter for the Empire, not Senior Fleet Systems' more dramatic-looking TIE Fighter line. Now, the A-Series was pretty generic. It was essentially just a pod for a cockpit with two pylons with engines attached onto them. During the Stark Hyperspace War, decades before the Clone Wars had started, these ships were quite popular amongst planetary defense forces. They're actually pretty bare bones when it came to armor and weapons, and they lacked the hyperdrive and were pretty much carrier or planet-side based. But they were also dirt cheap and performed well enough that even Jedi would occasionally pilot them. Quad Drive Yards would eventually update the A6 into the A7 Hunter. It still had no hyperdrive, no shields, minimal support systems, and only two laser cannons. And while it was faster and more agile than the TIE Fighter, it was also relatively more expensive than the easier to produce TIE line. Although the A7 Hunter would eventually be rejected for mass production, many Imperial officers did buy these ships specifically for their own capital ships. Cygnus Spaceworks might not be a manufacturer you're familiar with, but you're definitely familiar with some of their products, like the Lambda-class shuttle and also the ETA-class shuttle. As you can tell, this company has a preference for tri-wing designs, and so the Alpha-class XG-1 Starwing, the company's first and only starfighter, also sports this design with an additional two folding wings to increase maneuverability and control in atmosphere. The Starwing was far more maneuverable and a lot faster than anything else Cygnus Spaceworks had developed at this point. The ship had two laser cannons and two ion cannons above the cockpit, and then two concussion missile launchers or proton torpedo launchers on the sides of the cockpit. Cygnus Spaceworks made the Starwing a bit bigger than your traditional Starfighter, and so unlike the TIE Fighter, it had robust shields and a hyperdrive making this ship a perfect response to the Rebellion's fast-moving snub fighters, which oftentimes vanished into hyperspace after launching their raids. However, the Starwing lacked the maneuverability to engage smaller starfighters in dogfights like the X-Wing and A-Wing. It would suffer similar issues that the ARC-170 would have during the Clone Wars against the droid fighters. The Star Wing was essentially a stopgap measure for the Empire as they rushed to create more advanced versions of the TIE Fighter like the TIE Defender and the TIE Avenger. Well guys, before we continue, a word from our sponsor today, Raid Shadow Legends. The premier character building focused RPG game. It's all about building the best team possible and then throwing them into a wide range of PvP and PvE matches. As you continue your journey through the worlds of Teleria, you'll get to know your character's abilities, skills, strengths, and weaknesses better, and also add additional heroes to the roster. Raid Legends is free and available on PC and mobile devices, and constantly being updated with new features, tournaments, and world events. Especially this month, there'll be plenty of Halloween-themed shenanigans going on, including one really terrifying Halloween champion that you can collect. Now, if this sounds like something you'd be interested, please check our description down below for more information or scan this QR code. New players who sign up will get the epic hero Chanaru, who's great in the Doom Tower, along with 200,000 silver, one XP boost, one energy refill, and one ancient shard so you can summon an additional badass champion. These rewards will be in your inbox for the next 30 days only. Thank you for your patience. Now on to the rest of the video. When the Galactic Empire began nationalizing shipyards, Incom Corporation, creators of the Z-95 Headhunter and the ARC-170 Starfighter, were also swept up in Palpatine's effort to create a massive and cheap military through economy of scale. At the time, Incom's premier design and engineering team was working on the prototype of what would become the T-65 X-Wing. Unfortunately, most talented thinkers are going to be independent-minded, and of course, these designers and engineers would defect from the Empire and give the X-Wing to the Rebellion. 
which is kind of a good thing for the X-Wing because although it was superior in many ways to the basic TIE Fighter, it would have never won a contract over the much smaller and cheaper platform. The defection of the X-Wing team would have been pretty awkward for those who decided to stay in Incom Corporation and remain loyal to the Empire. Incom engineer Joe Isley would go on to create Incom's first Starfighter for the Empire, and that was the I-7 HAL Runner. After watching a pack of HAL Runners from the planet of Kamar relentlessly chase and attack their prey. These things looked terrifying. The I-7 HAL runner was designed around a very aerodynamic fixed wing structure making it terrific for atmospheric flight because it actually had maneuvering flaps on its control surfaces. The ship was lightly equipped and a bit better in performance than the standard TIE fighter. It also had the added benefit of having deflector shields. But its twin laser cannons were pretty weak and the fighter's rudimentary targeting system was a problem as well. Ultimately, because that Incom team defected to the Galactic Empire, most of the political and military elites in the galaxy hated Incom Corporation. However, the I-7 HAL Runner was used in smaller, older fleets stationed in the Outer Rim. By this point, you've probably figured out that the Empire really likes things with Alpha in its label. Just like any individual who lacks self-confidence and needs to label everything around himself so that he can kind of understand what his role in the world is or something, I, I, I don't know. The Alpha 3 Nimbus class V-Wing from Quad Systems Engineering was introduced in the last year of the war as a replacement for the V-19 Torrent Starfighter. It was created at a time when the Republic was seriously reconsidering their Starfighter doctrine after the disastrous loss of the majority of the ARC-170s deployed during the Battle of Coruscant. Civilian and military officials within the Republic were calling for smaller ships with smaller crews that were much more maneuverable and able to outturn a droid fighter, which was kind of impossible. The Alpha 3 Nimbus class V-Wing's hull was similar to other interceptors from Quad Drive Yards. It was wedge-shaped and extremely thin, trading speed and less weight for protection. In many ways, the ship was was quite similar to the Delta VII Aether Sprite Light Interceptor made by Quad for the Jedi. What made the V-Wing more uh, easy to identify was its vertical stacked twin ion engines. It also lacked a pressurized cockpit, large munitions, and hyperdrive to save weight. This made for an extremely agile and fast ship. It also had side-mounted S-foils to keep its robust reactor cool. Overall, the V-Wing was a pretty well-designed light interceptor, better than anything else the Republic had at the time. But the problem was, with the rise of the Empire, the V-Wing no longer had an enemy to fight. And because of its high cost, the V-Wing, like many other starfighters, was mostly rejected by the Empire. Someone keeps asking me in the comment section below to review some Imperial gunships, and so without further ado, today we'll be taking a look at the GAT-12 Skip Ray Blast Boat. Now, the Blast Boat designation only exists in Star Wars, and it basically means gunship. We're talking about something smaller than a Corvette, but with a similar amount of weaponry, but larger than a Starfighter, but with a similar amount of maneuverability. Essentially, these ships are a freak of nature, like most athletic tight ends in the NFL. The GAT-12 Skip Ray Blast Boat was from Senior Fleet Systems, and at least in the beginning of the war, this 25 meter long vessel was the smallest ship in the Imperial fleet equipped with a hyperdrive. The blast boat had plenty of weapons, as its name would suggest. This includes two missile launchers, laser cannon turrets, ion cannons, along with a tractor beam. The GAT-12, however, did not fit in well with the Imperial Navy's new starfighter strategy, which involved a large amount of cheaply produced non-hyperdrive equipped starfighters. Built by Quad Drive Yards, the VT-49 Decimator looks quite similar to the TIE Reaper in looks and function. It's what you would call a prestige starship. By that I mean it was a very well-built and fully equipped transport slash gunship. This 38 meter long ship was equipped with a class one hyperdrive and had two quad laser cannons along with twin concussion missile launchers. It was mainly used as a reconnaissance unit or a picket ship. For career officers, commanding a decimator meant that you're most likely going to be posted in the outer rim and going up against bandits and pirates, and during times of peace, this was a great way to get a promotion and get closer to commanding a capital ship. Of course, we can't talk about Imperial Starfighters without dipping into the TIE Fighter line, but most of you know almost every TIE Fighter out there, but did you know about the TIE CA Punisher Starfighter? Otherwise known as the TIE Capital Assault, this was a heavy bomber variant of the TIE Bomber. Instead of just having one weapons pod, the TIE CA had four, which means four times the firepower, which is kind of ridiculous if you think about it. The TIE CA Punisher was designed to tackle fortifications, enemy starships, and ground forces. By the way, when they say bomber in Star Wars, they usually don't mean like dumb bombs. Instead, they're talking about concussion missiles and proton torpedoes as far as ordnance goes, and not whatever this nonsense is. 
For all you Rebels fans out there, you're probably familiar with Grand Admiral Thrawn's TIE Defender program, and one of the few Imperial Snowfighters that truly had space superiority over the Rebel Line Starfighter Corps. But have you ever heard of the TIE PH Phantom? This was a similar tri-wing TIE Fighter concept that stemmed from the failed V-38 Assault Fighter prototype. But what made the TIE Phantom so special was the fact that it was carrying an extremely advanced prototype cloaking device using Stygium crystals, which essentially could warp light to make things invisible to the naked eye. This is what Starkiller had on his ship, the Rogue Shadow. Since all Starfighter dogfights take place within line of sight, this would be a huge advantage for Imperial pilots to have. This ship was also unusually well equipped for a TIE Fighter and featured shields and a Class 1 hyperdrive, meaning that this ship could also be used for long-range reconnaissance. Unfortunately for the Empire, the Rebellion immediately knew what they were looking at and tried very hard to destroy the Phantom supply chain and also manufacturing depots. Well, there you have it, guys. Eight lesser-known starships within the Galactic Empire. Let me know in the comment section below what you think and what we should tackle next. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.